the world's greatest stories, brought to you by Nelson Olmstead. Master pens of the literary world have come stories which live, powerful in their tragedy, tenderness, or romance. These are the world's greatest stories. Such stories Nelson Olmsted brings you, and tonight the narrative is by one of the world's favorite authors, Robert Louis Stevenson, who wrote Markheim. Markheim had just entered the shop on the daylight streets, and his eyes had not yet grown familiar with the mingled shine and darkness. Before the near presence of the flame of the candle the dealer held up, he blinked painfully and looked aside. The dealer chuckled. <laughs> you come to me in a Christmas day when you know that I'm alone in me house, put up me shutters and make a point of refusing business. What is it you wish me to buy this time? Something from your uncle's cabinet? Said Markheim. This time, I've not come to sell but to buy. I have no curios to dispose of. My uncle's cabinet is bare to the wainscot. And even were it still intact, I've done well on the stock exchange and should more likely add to it than otherwise. And my errand today is simplicity itself. I seek a Christmas present for a lady. And certainly, I owe you every excuse for disturbing you upon so small a matter on Christmas Day. But the thing was neglected yesterday. I must produce my little compliment at dinner and, as you very well know, a rich marriage is not a thing to be neglected. Well, sir. Be it so. You're an old customer, after all. Now, I have a nice thing for a lady. That hand glass. Fifteenth century warranted. Comes from a good collection, too. Just a moment, I'll get it for you. The old dealer turned around, searched in the lower shelves, against the wall. Then, as he began to re-arise, Markheim bounded from behind upon his victim. The long skewer-like dagger flashed and fell. The dealer struggled like a hen, striking his temple on the shelf, and then... Tumbled on the floor in a heap. Dead. Time had a score of small voices in that shop. Some stately and slow as was becoming to their great age. Others garrulous and hurried. All these told out the seconds in an intricate chorus of tickings. These clocks sounded inordinately loud to Markham as he looked around the shop. Time, now that the deed was accomplished. Time, which had closed for its victim had become instant and momentous for the slayer. This thought was yet in his mind when first one and then another, with every variety of pace and force, one deep as a bell from a cathedral turret, another ringing its treble notes the prelude of the waltz, the clocks began to strike the hour of three in the afternoon. The sudden outbreak of so many tongues in the dumb chamber staggered him. He began to bestir himself, going to and fro with the candle, beleaguered by moving shadows, and startled to the soul by chance reflections. Here, within the house, was he alone? He knew he was, for he'd watched the servant set forth, sweethearting in her poor best, out for the day, written in every ribbon and smile. Yes, he was alone, of course. And yet, in the bulk of that empty house about him, he could surely hear the stir of delicate footing. He was surely conscious, inexplicably conscious, of some presence. Markheim reflected he was wasting precious time. The money... That was now Markheim's concern, and as a means, the keys. He shuddered as he took them from the murdered dealer and tiptoed stealthily up the stairs into the dealer's own room. The sense that he was not alone grew upon him to the verge of madness. He longed to be home, girt in by walls, buried among the bedclothes, and invisible to all but God. About God himself, he was at ease. His act was doubtless exceptional, but so were his excuses, which God knew. It was there and not among men. And he felt sure of justice. Once in the room, he used the many keys to open the desks and cases. It was slow work, but he had to have the money that must be hidden there. Suddenly, he was startled. He seemed to feel a flash of ice, a flash of fire, a bursting gush of blood. And then he stood transfixed. A step mounted the stair slowly and steadily. And presently, a hand was laid upon the knob. And the lock clicked, and the door opened. 
pair held, held Markheim in a vice. But when a face was thrust into the aperture, glanced round the room, looked at him, nodded and smiled as if in friendly recognition, and then withdrew again, and the door closed behind it. His fear broke loose from his control in a hoarse cry. At the sound, the visitor returned. Did you call me? He asked pleasantly. And with that, he entered the room and closed the door behind him. Markheim stood and gazed at him with all, with all his eyes. Perhaps there was a film upon his sight. But the outline of the newcomer seemed to change and waver like those of the idols in the wavering candlelight of the shop. And at times he thought he knew him. And at times he thought he bore a likeness to himself. And always like a lump of living terror, there lay in his bosom the conviction that this thing was not of the earth and not of God. And yet the creature had a strange air of the commonplace as he stood looking on Markheim with a smile. And then he added, You're looking for the money, I believe? Well, I should warn you that the maid has left her sweetheart earlier than usual and will soon be here. If Mr. Markheim be found in the house, I need not describe to him the consequences. You know me? Oh, you've long been a favorite of mine. I've long observed and often sought to help you. What are you? The devil? If what I may be cannot affect the service I propose to render to you, it can. It does. Be helped by you? No. You don't know me yet. Thank God you don't know me. Oh, I know you. I know you to the soul. Know me? No one really knows me. My life is but a travesty and slander on myself. My excuse is known to me and God. But had I the time, I could disclose myself. To me? To you before all. You propose to judge me by my acts. Think of it, my acts. I was born, and I've lived in a land of giants. Giants have dragged me by the wrist since I was born out of my mother. The giants of circumstance. And you would judge me by my acts. But can't you look within? Can't you understand that evil is hateful to me? Can't you see within me the clear writing of conscience, never blurred by willful sophistry, although too often disregarded? Can't you read me for a thing that surely must be as common as humanity, the unwilling sinner? Oh, all this is very feelingly expressed. But it regards me not. These points of consistency are beyond my province. I care not in the least by what compulsion you may have been dragged away, so long as you are but carried in the right direction. But time flies. The servant delays looking in the faces of the crowd, but still she keeps moving nearer. And remember, it is as if the gallows itself was striding toward you through the Christmas streets. Shall I help you? I, who know all, shall I tell you where to find the money? For what price? I offer you the service for a Christmas gift. No, I'll take nothing at your hands. It may be credulous, but I'll do nothing to commit myself to evil. I have no objections to a deathbed repentance. Because you disbelieve in their efficacy. I do not say so. Murder is to me no special category. All sins are murder, even as all life is war. I behold your race like starving mariners on a raft plucking crusts out of the hands of famine and feeding on each other's lives. I follow sins beyond the moment of their acting. I find that in all, the last consequence is death. Do I say that I follow sins? I follow virtues also. They differ not by the thickness of a nail. They are both scythes for the reaping angel of death. Evil, for which I live, consists not in action but in character. The bad man is dear to me, not the bad act, whose fruits, if we could follow them far enough down the hurtling cataract of the ages, might yet be found more blessed than those of the rarest virtues. And it is not because you've killed a dealer, but because you are Markheim, that I offer to forward your escape. I don't understand what you are, but I'll lay my heart open to you. Say the money that I get here today be lost, and I'm a plunged again in poverty. Shall one part of me, and that the worst, continue until the end to override the better? Evil and good run strong in me, hailing me both ways. I don't love the one thing, I love all. Are my vices only to direct my life, and my virtues to lie without effect, like some passive lumber of the mind? Not so. Good also is a spring of acts. Oh, for six and thirty years that you've been in this world, through many changes of fortune and varieties of humor, 
I've watched you steadily fall. Downward, downward lies your way. Nor can anything but death avail to stop you. Content yourself with what you are, for you will never change. And the words of your part in this stage of life are irrevocably written down. At this moment, the sharp note of a doorbell rang through the house, and the visitant, as though this were some concerted signal for which he had been waiting, changed at once in his demeanor. The maid, she has returned as I forewarned you, and now you must get rid of her in the same manner you handle the dealer. Up, up, friend. Your life hangs trembling in the scales. Up and act. If I be condemned to evil acts, there's still one door of freedom open. I can cease from action. If my life be an ill thing, I can lay it down. My love of good is damned to barrenness, but I still have my hatred of evil. And from that to your galling disappointment, you shall see that I can draw both energy and courage. With these words, the features of the visitor began to undergo a wonderful and lovely change. They brightened and softened with a tender triumph. And even as they brightened, faded and dislimbed. But Markheim did not pause to watch or understand the transformation. He opened the door, went downstairs, and confronted the maid in the threshold with something like a smile. He said, You'd better go for the police. I've killed your master. The story of Markheim, one of the most famous of the world's greatest stories, has been reviewed by Nelson Olmsted, who now has a closing word. Robert Louis Stevenson, who wrote Markheim in 1884, uh, once again delved into his favorite topic, that of a man failing through weakness. When I first read Markheim, I confess I discovered myself confused as to the exact identity of the visitor. Was he actually the devil, as Markheim thought? Was he Christ? Or was he the better self of Markheim? Well, I believe the most logical conclusion is that the stranger was Christ, come to aid this man who was weak and who sunk deeper into evil the longer he lived. This conclusion is also heightened by the fact that the story takes place on Christmas Day. Had Christ preached to Markheim, he would have resented it, even as you and I, and most certainly would have concluded his purpose of murder and robbed the store. Instead, Markheim was persuaded subtly to repent, well, incidentally, there is much of parallel in this story to Stevenson's longer narrative, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Well, on our next program, uh, next Monday night, we plan to bring you a very special program in commemoration of Edgar Allan Poe's birthday, January the 18th. It's a program based upon his most famous work, The Raven. Until Monday night, good night and good reading. each week over these same stations Nelson Olmsted brings you the world's greatest stories in review. Next Monday night listen for The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. has reached you from our Chicago studios. This is the National Broadcasting Company.